Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the IoT Leaders Podcast. My name is Nick Earl. I'm the CEO of SI, an IoT company. And this is the podcast that attempts to demystify the wonderful but sometimes complex world of IoT. And in this week's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Mikhail Persson, who's the CTO of a very interesting company called Sigma Connectivity. Mikhail, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, and, and thanks. Thanks uh, for letting me join the podcast. <laughs> now, I want to dive straight in because I went to your website. In fact, I would encourage any people listening, uh, as you are listening, if you if you can, you jump on a browser and, and you know, go to Sigma Connectivity because there's a, a whole series of cool products and you guys are in the product design business, but you actually bring ideas to life. I mean, it's much more than product design uh, and we'll get into that. And and also we'll get into in this show where it could be going in the future and in particular, some of the amazing things that could be happening around 5G. So there's a tremendous amount to uh, talk about, but let's start first by, by uh, going back in the history, I know I know you're based in uh, Lund in uh, in Sweden, and um, this, uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, this came out of a, a, a cooperation between uh, Ericsson and Sony, isn't it? Maybe you can just share the history of Sigma connectivity. Yeah, I would I would be happy to. I mean, uh, Ericsson and Sony made a uh, joint venture. 2000, 2001, called uh, Sony Ericsson. And I think most people know about this company and they produced uh, yeah, some of the coolest mobile phones. I was going to say, they, they, were, yeah. they were really cool <laughs> at the time. They were the coolest yeah. phones, right. Uh, and I, uh, I joined, uh, I came from Ericsson and into this company in the early beginning. And at the time we were like, I don't know, 500 people here in Lund. And in the end we were 6,000. Uh, and uh, I worked with uh, RF and antennas um, then. And it was uh, really a journey uh, where we started with uh, dual band uh, GSM phones and ended up with uh, 4G capable uh, phones. And we delivered, amongst others, the first edge product to the market and uh, we delivered uh, yeah, what was it called? Uh, the Walkman theme. We rebranded that into the mobile phones and so on. So it was a, a really cool journey. However, uh, we got competition from, amongst others, Apple. Uh, the market went a little bit down for Sony Ericsson. And eventually, the all shares were bought by Sony Mobile. Uh, and then shortly after that, Sony Mobile moved, moved their center of excellence or headquarter for making mobile phones to Tokyo. And uh, this development unit in Lund that was probably one of Europe's strongest was eventually sold to uh, Don Olofsson and the Sigma family. And that's where 2013 and, and our company was created with 174 uh, of the strongest engineers on the market. So that's that's the start, actually, of uh, wow. Sigma connectivity. That, that's interesting because you had the world's coolest phones. Obviously, I mean, no, at that time, Nordic, the Nordic area was the center for everything wireless. I mean, so much advanced, and obviously Nokia, uh, and we all know what happened there. And then uh, uh, with the move to Japan, and then the reinvention, rebirth, mm -hmm. and you're the CTO. And now, if we just jump ahead to today, and we'll get into exactly what you guys do. But but you've grown quite a bit, haven't you? Um, how many people are you today? Yeah, we have at 2013, we were 174 and presently we are 600. So we have a little bit more than tripled the company. Uh, and we have also grown uh, over, over sites. So we have today sites or development units in Warsaw, in Poland, in Copenhagen, in Linköping. We also have in Stockholm. And then we have uh, three offices uh, on the west coast of US in San Diego and San Jose. Mm. Well, one of the things I, I, I read about you guys is uh, obviously you're into uh, design and we'll talk about the process for how, how you do that. But you also, one of the big assets that I understand that you've got is a, a lab, a testing lab, certification, 
uh, creating prototypes, etc. And it's one of it's one of the largest ones um, outside of the the big mobile phone companies, for example, isn't it? The largest ind- one of the largest independent labs in the world. Yeah, it is. It's uh, we really got a strong asset. Uh, so at the time. Sigma bought out how do you say this development unit they, we also got to get all the labs with us uh, so at that time we had a really fully fully developed labs to do mobile phones uh, everything from acoustical chambers to antenna chambers and uh, x-ray machines uh, we even got the small prototype lab and uh, it's actually a lot easier to talk about things we don't have compared to to what we have <laughs> however however since 2013 we have of course continued to develop this lab since it's a really strong um, asset we have we don't need to send anything anywhere or even lend equipment uh, from anyone we we have of of it in-house uh, and, and it, it, i understand it's as far as you know, and we don't know what perhaps might be in China, but as as far as you know, it's it's the largest lab outside of China. You think that that is can actually be sort of hired or contracted with by enterprise companies. Exactly. Um, so you are the the essentially the world leader. Uh, let's assume for the moment that there's uh, nothing in China bigger, but there might be. But but um, you're certainly the world leader for Western uh, countries where you can actually uh, engage um, to design um, a IoT smart enabled product, but from scratch. And, and let, let's let's talk about that. I'm going to use an example. Um, I, I uh, Yesterday in the house, uh, my wife and I were in the kitchen and the uh, there was a song came up on an advert or an old TV show. I can't remember what it was. And my wife said, oh, oh I remember that. It was Kid Creole and the Coconuts. <laughs> uh, uh, school pigeon or stool pigeon she couldn't remember the name and so i just said you know alexa play kid creole and the Co- coconuts school pigeon now, it turns out <laughs> stool pigeon but instantly it started playing and i as it started playing i just said to her i said you know you know 15 20 years ago even 10 years ago that would have been magic i mean that would have been unthinkable mm. uh, you know you just remember something and it appears, and you can of course ask it questions and whatever. But the point about it was that there was a design process. That, that, yes, it's technology, but there was a design process, and it starts off with you know imagining something previously mm. impossible. Mm. I, I saw a phrase you use. You call it from uh, uh, post-it to product. Mm. So 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 it's not just the labs, is it? But maybe you can just talk me through what's your process. Well, you know, sort of high level from the from the beginning to the end, if someone comes with it to you with an idea, mm. uh, what happens? So uh, obviously we have uh, customers that are rather small or new. Uh, and then we have, uh, of, of course, uh, customers that are very mature uh, within the electronics business. But if if a company uh, of, often often the company, uh, they have an ID. Uh, it's kind of this uh, napkin uh, drawing. They have an idea of what, how they would like to uh, win, win the market. Um, then we typically take this idea into a uh, innovative forum uh, where we have a couple of really innovative uh, persons that are uh, skilled with the latest technology uh, out there. So kind of our seniors. And trying to to lift this ID and also sometimes kill it <laughs> uh, if it's if we don't believe in it, so to say. Not uh, every idea is a good one. Yeah, exactly. So so we 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 try to um, um, what I would say is that I, I, we are very good at understanding what is technically possible, and if it is technically possible technically possible, then we can fix it, so to say. But if it's not, then we can't. Right. Uh, so from that point, we move this product ID into a uh, concept. And that's where you start to elaborate with 
components. Uh, you start to look at which platforms it should be on, the software baseline, uh, uh, where to produce it, the risks and the mitigations. Uh, so essentially, when you go out of concept, you would have the recipe in your hand. It would be the kind of the perfect decision material to push the trigger and go into development or not. Um, and you, so and doing this I, in, in uh, excuse me, you're doing this in Lund, in Sweden primarily. In so, but your clients could be anywhere in the world. I mean, people in the US listen to the podcast. Absolutely. Companies in the US who are thinking of creating something, they could engage with you guys uh, remotely, uh, and um, it's a it doesn't they don't have to send a team over to live in Lund for uh, a few months. No, no, exactly. So that's a really strong benefit. And this is, of course, the reason why we have offices uh, in uh, in US. So this customer would get a contact person that is most likely an American. Uh, and uh, they could talk uh, daily during their time zone. And this person would, for us, then translate the information back to Lund in a technical way, uh, making sure that the team here can work efficiently uh, with this client. Great. And then, of course, we have late uh, evening meetings uh, with US, uh, US team. So that's right. Uh, actually, we have seen zero problems uh, with this setup. It works very, very efficiently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and again, uh, there's some really, you know, it's a sort of uh, it's not just the technology, but also the the the, the Scandinavian design, the the, the Scandinavian uh, chic. I mean, some of the products you make are beautiful, frankly. I mean, some of the pictures on the website are are amazing. So, um, uh, uh, you have roughly how many clients? Have you how many products have you designed since two thousand and thirteen? Uh, I think we have in the order of 300 to 400 clients and we have done well we, we typically do like 30 projects a year uh, okay yeah. and 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 just as a final question on the process um if i came to you with an idea uh, to change the world mm. uh, i don't know whether it's possible but i start this process <laughs> um <laughs> from the typical if there is any such thing as typical <laughs> how long does it take from the initial first meetings through to perhaps a uh, working prototype, let's say? Hmm. We, we believe in, um, uh, in, in, how do you say, uh, put the shovel in the ground directly. Uh, so we try to get rid of the pep paper exercise uh, very quickly. And uh, we do not move in so much into this PowerPoint uh, philosophy. We believe in building prototypes early. Since we know that IoT is, it's uh, from a marketing perspective, it's uh, very easy, but in reality, it's quite complex. Uh, so we want to move in very quickly into prototypes. So our customer very early can look and feel and touch uh, the device um, and, and test it. And as soon as, as long as we still are within, how do you say, the conceptual framework, then you could do any type of changes to the product. However, when you push the trigger and go into the real development, then of course all the costs uh, start to come in. And then, so, so we rather like our customers to feel safe uh, before moving into development. And is there, a, is there an average time it takes before they have to press that button? Are we talking? six months or i mean if you want to do a mobile phone i would say the conceptual phase is probably 12 weeks uh and then that's, you have that's fairly complicated a moment yeah. and not everybody does a mobile phone or an iot device is that is that less complex than a mobile phone then, then it's a little bit less complex so but i would say there is no concept shorter than four weeks so you are okay. between four and 12 weeks well. uh, yeah yeah you know we you, you and i first met we were introduced by um uh, Talis Gimalto, and because um, uh, we're in the related field, of course, in, at SI on the connectivity. And the point mm -hmm. you made there, I just want to go back to about IoT being complex. It's it's come up in every single one of these IoT leaders podcasts. Mm -hmm. It's the reason we started the show. Um, it is unbelievably um, uh, complex, um, and just the uh, the cellular connectivity alone 
uh, you know, we the, one of the most common things people say to us, but it, it can't be that complicated. I just is just a case of inserting a SIM card mm. in, and it'll work all the way around the world first time <laughs> because that's their perception that they think, well, my phone works, doesn't it? Yeah, but it, yeah. it's not the same, is it? I mean, IoT, the the connectivity part, um, it, it's it's intrinsically linked to the device yeah. design, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it and it's not ubiquitous just by putting a SIM card mm. into the device. But I mean, using a module today, uh, obviously you save uh, a lot of energy in the NRE, uh, and you also save Not a lot of engineering. Exactly, yeah. and you also save a lot in the testing phase, uh, and also for the uh, operator approvals uh, and stuff like this. However, you still you still need to take care of your of your board design. You could still run into EMC issues. You could still run into yeah a lot of uh, issues with this design so i'm i'm actually i mean we are really pro uh, working with uh, modules we think it's uh, uh, excellent actually uh, to do that but you will not get rid of all your problems yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and just for some leaders who wonder what what we meant by there the modules the so for example in the uh, talis module uh, that we were talking about formerly jamalto um, uh, SI's connectivity software is embedded inside mm. an application firmware inside mm. the uh, uh, module. But as you say, the module then has to be designed into mm. the device. But the in intent is, uh, and the reality is that, the, that then you switch the module on and it, you get ubiquitous global uh, mm. connectivity through a single platform. And, and just to finish off on what you do, but you, you, you actually then also take it through to certification um, mm. because that's a, that's a big and can be an expensive process. We know we've we've also uh, helped design, not end to anywhere near the extent that you have, but we've done over 300 projects. So we've done about the same number of projects, mm. but but we don't do the certification side because that's mm. really very specialist, you know, GSMA certification, mm. various other local country certifications, MNO, mm. mobile network operator uh, certifications. It's a complex area, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is, it, it's, and it's really, uh, tough as well. I mean, we often get this question: uh, to what level do I need to certify this, and and how much can can I do myself, and, uh, and so on. And it's very hard to answer. You need to look into each specific project uh, every time. Uh, so what we what we offer is um, we do all the pre-certification, so we know that the unit will pass 100% uh, before when going to type approval. And then, of course, we have uh, certification houses uh, that are partners to us. Uh, so we get very uh, fast, how do you say, uh, answers uh, coming back. So we're trying to be, since we're 100% NRE driven, we try to be uh, very efficient to our customers because that's the only way to keep the cost down. If we're efficient, then we work fast and the project come out faster and then the overall cost will be lower for our customers, I'd say. So we have, of course, uh, internal type approval preparation, uh, documentation, what to look at uh, and so on. And since we have done it so many times, we know it by heart. <laughs> okay, let's pivot. Um, because uh, when we were talking prior to the podcast, you sort of you dropped into the conversation and uh, mm. uh, uh, something, uh, an area that you're moving into aggressively going forward, which is the area of 5G. And, mm. and um, uh, 5G, we were, we were talking, uh, the last podcast I did with the, the guests, we were talking about the, the Gartner hype cycle, who's an ex-Gartner consultant. And, you know, what's interesting is that 5G is absolutely today at the peak of the Gartner hype cycle. I mean, it's the magic powder that can do everything 5g is the answer to yeah. everything and of course we know that after that it it, it comes down into the what they call the trough of disillusionment uh, but then it then you get the final adoption so so but it will be an incredibly important uh, set of technologies yeah. um and um you've uh decided not just to be able to have 5g expertise but but you've also um uh started to license some of the uh core of the technology uh, mm. yourselves to have a differentiated approach. So before we get into the use cases that you see of 5G, uh, the early use cases, um, uh, maybe you can just share a little bit on what you'll be doing uh, with your relationship with Qualcomm. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, 
I think I would like to start that around, uh, I think we are in our fifth year now with 5G. Uh, so we started out very early uh, in the, and it's still very early, I would say within 5G, but we started out uh, with uh, a cooperation with Ericsson and started out helping them with 5G development. And of course, then we helped ourselves as well in terms of uh, competence. Uh, and since during these five years, uh, we have very devoted, uh, looked into 5G uh, and which areas to, how do you say, focus on and uh, where we believe there will be uh, um, actually customers in the end um, coming in. So we, we started four or five years ago. And since then, we have developed, of course, mobile phones on 5G for some of our customers. But uh, now we think the market is, is ready to uh, start to realize uh, industrial 4.0 and private networks and all of this. So we, a year ago, invested in uh, our lab. Uh, so we now have a fully developed 5G lab with including antenna chambers uh, for FR1, but also antenna chambers for FR2 bands, the, the high frequency bands. Um, so we bought a scatter chamber from, uh, from Anritsu. Uh, of course, we also have the communication testers and network analyzers and uh, all of the above. So we have the capability now to test any device within 5G. Um, yeah, with all tests needed, basically. So next step for us uh, was to acquire licenses. Uh, obviously, when working with mobile phones, we, we don't have those licenses. There we have worked under our customers' licenses. But uh, for, for IoT, which we believe will be one really strong market uh, for 5G long term, we invested in um, uh, Qualcomm licenses. Uh, so we're now, I think, quite early actually into this private network, but uh, we would like to be on top of this since we really believe in it. Mm. And, and so, um, so you'll have the uh, Qualcomm licenses, you, you'll have many components of the 5G value chain, if you like. Yeah. Um, and, and so let's talk about the early uh, use cases. And um, uh, the area of um, factories, certainly something that we've seen here at SI, mm. is the uh, factories with huge amounts of legacy equipment mm. Uh, mm. predating IoT, mm. Mm. Uh, potentially millions of, of, of sensors. Mm. Uh, and, and the whole area of, of private IoT, 5G, uh, pri private 5G networks mm. is being talked about a lot. Is, is that also where you see um, some of the opportunity in it? And uh, if so, how are you going about trying to find out where the first projects are? Um, we believe in, uh, in private networks, especially for the millimeter wave, wave um, um, frequencies. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reason is uh, all the benefits uh, out of it. I mean, to, today, many factories are actually run on Wi-Fi uh, or thick cabling. Uh, Wi-Fi is a really good thing. <laughs> we develop a lot of Wi-Fi, but it's not stable enough uh, for running a, a factory on. And cabling, then you're a little bit stuck. I think for the future, you would like to have a very flexible and scalable uh, production facility. So you would like to be able to move your equipment around and reuse your robots or yeah, whatever you're developing there. And then 5G is a really good possibility uh, here. So when it comes to private networks, and I don't know if people will be angry with me, but I, I see it. it 5G in that sense would be more like a expensive but super efficient Wi-Fi network <laughs> of the factory. <laughs> so we believe in that. And then also there are functionalities that will come out of 5G that we haven't seen yet, but that 
I think will make a whole lot of difference like UR LLC. Uh, you will also get indoor positioning with centimeter precision. Um, and apart from that, you will have low latency and high throughput. So with this, I believe there will be a lot of undeveloped things today that will be uh, for, for the future, so to say. So companies going in early, they will of course have the possibility to explore these possibilities early and then probably take their patents uh, on, on, uh, on those use cases, so to say. So, so we're clearly talking about things that have just not been possible before. As you say, Wi-Fi is great, but perhaps isn't, well, definitely isn't as robust as you need right now. It doesn't do the, uh, the precision location. If you, were, if you have some small robots moving around, let's say in a warehouse, moving mm -hmm. goods, you see those pictures on the TV of all these robots, these swarms of robots moving around. Wi-Fi was never built for that. No, um, no. All the legacy equipment, the millions of sensors, the latency issues, the bandwidth, I mean, the mm -hmm. amount of data yeah. that we're talking about per factory is just enormous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, exactly. if you really want information about everything, it, it, it's way beyond anything that we've seen so far, mm -hmm. the requirement. And I mean, we, since we are NRE driven and we charge our customers for our competence, uh, then we train and focus uh, on areas we believe will be the next big area, so to say. And industry 4.0, there is a lot of companies talking about, but I see very little actually happening physically. Uh, and that uh, we as a company would like to help out with. Uh, so we have set up internal teams focusing on the indoor positioning part. We're focusing uh, another team on security within 5G. We're focusing on machine learning um, because we think that will be a very vital part of this, taking decisions already out in the edge node. Uh, and of course, we're focusing on 5G uh, since that will be or very likely to be the main main carrier here. And if you combine all of those teams, then you have industry 4.0, according to me. It's only the use case missing. And for me, the use case is most likely it will be self-driving robots, lifting, lifting goods, moving it to another place. Uh, you would like to have uh, automatic control over your uh, stock in, in your warehouse, how many devices you have and articles you have and so on. We don't control the use case that our customers control, uh, but we at least think we are the one of the better providers that could help out realizing uh, the use case. And these networks, these private IoT networks, and we've, again, you know, at SI, we've, we've spoken to a lot of people, it, it, factories is one use case, but, you know, my, people's mines is another mm. use case, uh, mm. oil rigs, oil mm. refineries, anywhere where there's a huge amount of equipment, very dense uh, area, tightly packed together, uh, the uh, private 5G network starts to uh, make more commercial um, sense. Mm -hmm. And the, the network then, uh, just to explain to listeners, the network would um, uh, would be managed by a third party, right? So, that, so the, the, the factory owner or the enterprise that has the factories, they may be doing this across almost certainly multiple factories, multiple mm -hmm. warehouses, but, but a mobile network operator would play a role in in managing these uh, networks and there would be also cellular connectivity as well mm. um in uh, uh in backhauling that information back to the corporate infrastructure absolutely and uh, if you take your the wi-fi you have today that's managed by someone uh so if you have a problem or your data doesn't uh, come through or whatever, you need someone to take care of uh, all of this. Uh, so I, I think that's how you should probably see it, like a super advanced, uh, high feature <laughs> Wi-Fi kind of. Uh, so, super advanced, high feature Wi-Fi is the simple, mm -hmm. simplest explanation of 5G uh, that I've, that, that <laughs> I've least, heard. At least for the private network part. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but, 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 but Mikhail, not, not, 
not everybody has a factory, not everybody has a, a oil refinery. Do you believe these 5G devices will start to get into uh, sort of what I call public IoT um, devices? The use cases will actually become more uh, narrower and into certain industry verticals where there'll be use cases of uh, 5G, because that's what a, a lot of people so far have been uh, talking about. They've been talking about like vending machines or, or uh, remote devices for maintenance of complex equipment. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, um, already today, uh, we know that uh, GSM and uh, 3G will uh, um, will be removed. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. if you would like to have uh, uh, devices pinging, I don't know, a smaller amount of data, uh, then you would probably jump into CAT M1 uh, of the LTE or narrowband IoT of yeah. the LTE. And that is part of the 5G standard. So there you will have uh, your future for this, this type of devices. But then, of course, you still want to have your uh, car connected to 5G and utilize uh, V2X and everything else that will come out of 5G there. And of course, you will connect your mobile phones to the 5G networks because the history has shown us that uh, there will never be enough data. Uh, there will just be another app that requires much more bandwidth in the end uh, than you have. So we have seen that when, even from GSM, when we went to Edge and we had triple amount of data, that wasn't enough. And then we moved to 3G and then we moved to 4G. So. The evolution is there. We will be, we're more and more data hungry. Um, and in particular, on you mentioned uh, autonomous cars. I was reading up on some of the different technologies that are uh, out there to get the precision so, uh, for uh, mobile cars and, and the amount of data to, to get to, as you get towards 100% totally, you know, with level five, or whatever we call it, total autonomy, mm. um, uh, sort of no human involved at all. <laughs> um, uh, the, the last few percent, it just rockets exponentially in terms of the complexity and the data. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's beyond, we're not talking gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. So we're going to have to invent new words yeah. for the amount of data that's all, and it's all going to be connected today. All the devices will be sharing all of the data. It, it's something that we've, it's probably beyond what we thought a few years ago. I mean, uh, even uh, though we were dreaming a few years ago, it, it, it certainly we never dreamt that yeah. this was going to be happening. But I'm I'm also expecting to see uh, quite uh, data hungry devices, IoT devices like um, cameras for security reasons or so. It, it's probably likely to be connected also over 5G uh, in the near future. So I think you have the really high data hungry devices like car industry and mobile phones in the top and then you have the low data hungry devices uh, like temperature sensors and stuff like that on cat m1 and airband iot and then there will be a huge segment in the middle uh, with devices looking like mobile phones but they're not mobile phones they're more like uh, i don't know the gateways or uh, stuff like this that will be within uh, iot as well yeah we we see that in in, in terms of the in, um uh, classic industry uh, verticals what we, what we see i've mentioned these before things like you know vending machines let's take that mm. vending machines we can actually measure it vending machines when they started simply doing telemetry you know mm. how many cups of coffee have i I so delivered today. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you could be uh, doing on two megabytes uh, mm. of data a month. Mm. Okay, and then um, you know we're working with Costa, Costa Express, and there's ninety sensors in the machine, mm. and you can then easily get to hundred megabytes. And then you put uh, advertising promotions, basically mm. one way push promotions, mm. uh, and you can get into 100, 200 megabytes per machine. But it's still relatively low. Then you start getting people saying, well, actually, I'd like to do um, uh, advertising mm. uh, and uh, uh, personalized advertising to each machine mm. uh, based on who's standing in front of the machine because they identify themselves with the, code, mm. like, the QR code. And then you're into um, three gigabytes and whatever, but it's still, it's sort of what I call static video. But but then the idea 
of then you have the video and yeah. uh, we have a client who who we can't name who is got a, a vending machine that works completely on video and they they see who you are and you open the door you take stuff out you close the door and you walk away mm -hmm. um but it's cameras mm. you know work it works like the apple store um and uh, people don't believe it does but you know you 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 walk in you you uh, you identify yourself you walk in open the door take stuff out walk away once you're into that then the amount of data starts going absolutely mm. uh, crazy we we uh, uh you mentioned sony early on one of our clients is is uh, sony around the uh, ps4 and the ps5 mm -hmm. and you know just the uh, the amount of bandwidth needed for the games and and to download the games Mm. into the retail stores uh is is it starts to stretch the, the forward the top end the 4g it really mm. starts and especially if every you have this burst capacity and everybody mm. does everything at the same time and so i think there's a lot of pent-up demand for um uh 5g there's a lot of use cases we believe there's a lot of use cases out there that people have sort of got their head around but they're waiting for 5g yeah. and so we expect to see a lot of early adopters plunge in and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, maintenance devices that give uh, like a Pokemon type experience, mm -hmm. uh, augmented reality expansion of the bill of materials. And you can see all the data from the sensors. And the point about 5G is that you could be looking at that standing next to the truck. Mm. I don't know, the Volvo truck in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Or you could be looking at that hundreds of miles away. Oh, oh. Uh, and 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 it, 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 the experience wouldn't be that different. So mm. it is going to take our IoT world into a whole new, mm. a whole new area, and the amount of data and business opportunities, mm. uh, it's going to be very exciting. But back to the whole point about the podcast, it also adds a huge amount of complexity, which mm. I think is why companies like yours uh, uh, are needed because people say, I, I don't know how to design devices. I I don't know how to certify them. I, mm. I don't know what this world is all about. I don't know what mistakes I'm going to make and I will make mistakes. I just want someone who can at the very least tell me what not to do. Yeah, yeah. As exactly. you said earlier on, not every idea is a good idea. No. That's pretty valuable information. I mean, we are, uh, I would say very, I feel very lucky uh, actually to work for Sigma Connectivity. I get to see all this, uh, I think we're in this kind of a shift now from a technology perspective. Everything goes so much faster now than, than it is 10 or 15. Uh, there is, there are so many really, really cool uh, smaller components uh, companies uh, out there developing uh, their idea of the future. And we get the possibility to look into all of this and try to map it to our customers' use cases. Uh, so we are very early in looking into the latest and greatest within more or less every angle within electronics development. You, you get to see the, you, 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 well, you don't just get to see the future before it happens, you actually get to create the future. Exactly. So the, I mean, the best way to predict the future is, is to create it, right? That's what you do. Yeah, and I think this is partly why we have been so successful with keeping our engineers and keeping them happy with uh, letting them explore uh, uh, the future. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really amazing, actually. Uh, I feel it's really amazing for me uh, to work here and, and get to see all of this and also talk to companies like your, yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we're going to be talking a lot more <laughs> uh, together as part of our partnership, but but maybe that's a subject for another uh, <laughs> podcast uh, when uh, we've got uh, something uh, specific uh, to talk about, which I'm sure we will have shortly. But uh, for the moment, you know, we're probably at the end of our time. It is a fascinating area. Um, uh, when I first, just to finish off for our listeners, when I first went to Sigma Connectivity website, my first reaction, and that of my colleague who looked over my shoulder, at, at the screen said, wow, it looks like a really cool place to work. <laughs> Unless you actually go to your website, um, you um, it looked almost like a an advertising design house, not a technology <laughs> company. And I, I know that's deliberate, uh -huh. but, but the immediate reaction was, wow, what a cool place to work. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and you get to work on exciting things. So, so uh, Mikhail, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you again. Um, for Thank agreeing you. to uh, be on the uh, podcast. Very exciting time. 
especially um, with uh, with 5G coming. And uh, as you said right there at the end, there's going to be many more years <laughs> of incredibly exciting things to talk about. Yeah. Um, and that's the beauty of the world of IoT. So uh, just to uh, recap, uh, thanks to everyone for listening. listening. This was the IoT Leaders uh, podcast. If you have any uh, ideas, feedback, suggestions, um, you can uh, reach out to me, Nick Earl, E-A-R-L-E, um, uh, on um, LinkedIn, or um, you can send us an email, which is iotleaders at S-I-E-S-E-Y-E dot com. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it only remains for me to once again thank uh, Mikhail, uh, tell you to uh, buckle up and watch out uh, for some of the amazing things that uh, his engineers uh, are working on. And um, thank you again and tune in for the next few episodes of IoT Leaders podcast. Thanks again. And Mikhail, thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Nick.